Are you having a hard time figuring out what to get dad for Father's Day? You should check out Row One Brand's Vintage Pictorum Gallery. They have America's best sports art. With over 7,200 historic sports prints, you're assured to find something unique for dad this Father's Day. Instead of a boring old tie, get him a historic baseball photo taken by Henry High Sandum at the historic Polo Ground Stadium in New York City during the 1894 Temple Cup. Or, if he's an NFL buff, check out the 1963 vintage NFL poster. These are so good looking that you'll be amazed how they turn out. Shop now at sportshistorynetwork.com slash row one and save 15% off your order. This podcast is part of the Sports History Network, your headquarters for the yesteryear of your favorite sport. You can learn more at sportshistorynetwork.com. On January 28, 1959, the Green Bay Packers made one of the most important hires in NFL history. The namesake of the Super Bowl trophy was announced as a new Packers head coach. Yes, that is Vince Lombardi. Now in the same year, this week's guest was born into this world. His future coach of one of the greatest teams of all time would clash as a player with Lombardi for quite a few years in Chicago. Then about two decades later, this week's guest and the coach would combine to take home the Lombardi in 1985. And that coach? Well, he simply goes by... Ditka. Welcome to the Football History Dude Podcast, where each episode is a journey back in time to learn about the rich history of the NFL. Your host is Arnie Chapman. Football is his passion, and he wants you to come along with him to explore the yesteryear of the gridiron. So hop on board his DeLorean, and let's get this baby up to 88 miles per hour. This time as we step off the DeLorean, the date is August 21st, 1959, and we're hanging out in the middle of the Pacific Ocean. (laughs) I mean, what are we hanging out in the middle of the Pacific Ocean for? Well, check this. This is the day that the 50th state, Hawaii, becomes part of the United States of America. Oh yeah, this also happens to be the same day that this guest was born. This week's guest, well, he's just the punky QB of one of the greatest NFL teams in history. That's the 1985 Chicago Bears, Mr. Jim McMahon. So yeah, I get it. As a Detroit Lions fan and a son and grandson of lifelong Detroit Lions, this might be walking out on the edge a little bit. But hey, when you get a chance to talk to the dude who won two different Super Bowls, one with the Packers, one with the Bears, even though they're the rivals... You gotta go take a chance at it. But at any rate, I'll leave some links for other resources on the show notes for you, which you know you can get to through your podcast player or by heading to thefootballhistorydude.com, which is going to take you over to my page on the Sports History Network, the headquarters for your favorite sports yesteryear. This is a network that's still in the very early stages. So if you know of a podcast or other show that you think should be on the network, or if you're looking to start your own history show about your favorite sport, team, or league, go ahead and hit us up on the website at sportshistorynetwork.com slash contact. But let's go ahead and get right into this interview with Jim McMahon. Actually, that's something I wanted to kind of talk to you about. It was not successful. They, they weren't able to launch because of the weather. And it got, oh, me th- okay. it got me thinking, I was like, just just those astronauts having to sit there for, I don't know, eons, th- three hours, whatever it was with that anticipation. It got me thinking about, you know, with, with players such as yourself, what was that anticipation like when you, be- before the Super Bowl, the big game for you? What went through your mind? Uh, make it out alive. I'd be getting death threats uh, pretty much most of the week from a a quote that was attributed to me that was, you know, I, I never even said it, but some press guy went on the air and said that I had called all the women of New Orleans sluts and the men stupid and whatever else he said. But, uh, yeah, I don't know where the guy got the information from, but he just, and everybody that saw the news, thought, well, yeah, I guess he must have said that. So we had women picketing the hotel. I had people, I had death threats, you know, for four days and, 
Yeah, I don't really remember much of the game. I mean, as soon as the gun went off at the end of the game, my, my butt was in the tunnel and, and in the locker room and out of that stadium. Yeah, it wasn't, it wasn't the uh, Super Bowl Sunday that I was hoping for, other than, other than the victory. Yeah, that worked out that part for you, um, too. Uh, so you, went, you were in two Super Bowls, one as a starter and then one as a backup co- quarterback. What kind of advice did you give to Brett Favre before the, that game in 96? Oh, boy, I don't even remember. I just remember talking to him you know, during the preseason. Just saying how this this season was was looking exactly like the season we had in '85, because uh, we had just lost the NFC Championship game in 1984, and you know we knew we were going to be good in '85. And then uh, the same thing with Green Bay; we had just lost the NFC Championship game, and I noticed that the Super Bowl was going to be on the same day that we played it, uh, eleven years prior to that. Uh, I had no idea we'd be playing in the same stadium or against the same uh, opponent. That was pretty weird. So 11 years apart, same day, same opponent, and same result. You know, it was it was great to go for you know have the Pats go over for two in the Super Bowl until I retired. <laughs> they've done pretty well. They've done a lot better since, but uh, it was nice to beat them in the first two. Right. Yeah. I am. Um, as a Detroit Lions fan, I never got the chance. And of course, my dad growing up, he he probably had other unkind words for you and the Bears and then going with the Packers and that kind of thing. But speaking of growing up, I was born in 85, so I never really I didn't really remember your career that much, you know, except for watching the highlights. I always grew up. I, I was going to be Barry Sanders till obviously I wasn't because nobody can be. And I didn't get a chance to really watch. Walter Payton run what could you describe to me what was it like being his quarterback to watch him run from behind the scrimmage like that uh, it was poetry in motion to watch a lot of it um, early on when I first got there it wasn't wasn't pretty because our offensive line was not very good and he had been running behind that line for six years so <laughs> that'll tell you how good he really was a lot like Barry, you know, I think if Barry had ever, ever had a really good offensive line, who knows what he could have. But, uh, yeah, I saw Walter make some of the most incredible 30-yard runs and only gain two because he'd be going from sideline to sideline bouncing off people, and uh, he just did not like to be tackled. Yeah, I mean, speaking of, like you said, Barry Sanders not having the greatest of lines, um, again, going back to my childhood days growing up, I was going to be Barry Sanders um, – who who did you want to be when you're you know backyard? Who did you always pretend you were like? Well, I always idolized uh, Joe Namath. I, I liked his style. Like you know, he he said things, he backed it up, and uh, you know, he liked to have a good time. And that's pretty much how <laughs> that's pretty much how life my life has gone as well. Yeah, I've I've um I've read through and seen a few of the you know the videos and things like that of kind of your career. It kind of got me thinking about your high school. I saw that your coach was it Ernie Jacklin was your coach in high school. Uh, he was my coach at my high school in Utah. Yes. Well, what kind of advice or what was the biggest, most impactful thing that you took away from that coach that helped you go to the next level? Well, I actually learned a lot from my California coaches. That's where I grew up. And uh, I didn't move to Utah until I was a junior in high school. So, I was only there for two years and then five years of college, but uh, I learned a lot from my my first high school coaches. And my first coach was my dad. I mean, he coached me. He taught me how to play these sports and all the way up to high school. And uh, you know, this he taught me the you know the fundamentals and the rules. And he said, you know, you play hard as long as there's time on the clock. There's there's time to do something positive. So that's how I always uh, played the games. Yeah, I saw that again going back through some of the what they called the the Miracle Bowl, the game, the BYU. And so that mentality just kind of stuck through with you throughout then? Yeah, pretty much. I've always hated to lose. I don't like uh, – that's no fun. I mean, if you enjoy losing, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> right. I don't know. Yeah, you need to do something else for a living. But, uh, yeah, I don't, uh, I don't like it. Winning is a lot more fun. For sure, sure. And uh, – Speaking of winning, and you had a pretty good career there with with BYU. Uh, what drove you to go to that school out of high school? Well, the 
my big my first love was always baseball so that's what i wanted to do was play baseball and uh so all the college trips that i went on i would tell the the football coach hey i want to play baseball and the colleges that said i could or couldn't play there was only two that said i could and that was byu or nevada las vegas and nevada las vegas happened to be my last recruiting trip and it was a really good one had a good time and i came home and said dad i'm going to vegas and then he said, no, you're not. It's not a big enough school. It's this and that. He was worried about me, I guess, continuing on. I said, hey, I'll, I'll get to the next level. I'm not worried about that. But I want to have a good time in college. And uh, I'm sure Vegas would have been a lot better, a lot more fun. But uh, the way it worked out, I think it, uh, you know, BYU was, was pretty good. I, got, I learned a, a lot of football there. But I, I did get to play baseball my freshman year. Uh, but they didn't say I couldn't get out of spring football practice. And I was playing in the outfield. I play a game of a double header and throwing the ball from the outfield is a lot different than throwing the football from the pocket. And uh, so I had to make a decision after about 10 games. And I said, you know, football was my scholarship. So I'm just going to stick with that. Uh, you know, it ended up working out, but I think if I had gone on and played baseball, I wouldn't feel like I do these days as far as, you know, soreness in the body and stuff like that. That's something that, you know, uh, Players Against Concussions, you founded that, what, how many years ago? <sighs> I can't even remember. That's, <laughs> that's a bad concussions problem. But, uh, Jeremy, Jeremy Roenick and I uh, got together and, and started that organization. Uh, hockey players deal with a lot of these same issues that football guys do. Uh, you know, there's a lot of, you know, Cheerleaders nowadays are getting a lot of head injuries. You know, they've fallen off these pyramids and stuff like that. Uh, soccer players. I mean, it's just, it's been a, you know, pretty much any anything you can think of, it, it, you're going to have some head trauma. So that's why we wanted to, you know, start this organization and let the, you know, get the uh, education out there about head injuries and head traumas and, and how serious it can be. You don't have to take a big spill. You don't have to take a big fall. You just have to hit your head a, a you know, a certain way and you can cause a, a lot of damage. And uh, so we just wanted to, you know, make people aware, especially parents, because, you know, parents, I've seen a lot of them that just, you know, they, they see there's some of these kids as meal tickets. So they push them from the time they're born until they're, you know, in high school to, to do certain things. And it's just, you know, let them be kids. I mean, I think you can, you only need two years of high school football to, to get a scholarship if, if you're any good. Uh, because colleges will find talent, and so will the pros. They find talent. You know, not everybody in the pro roster is from, you know, Clemson or Alabama or USC. You know, there's a lot of a lot of little schools you probably never heard of. And guys, guys make it because they they've got talent, and that's what these scouts are paid for. To find the talent. Doesn't matter where you're from. So let them let them be kids. I wouldn't let them play football until they're at least juniors in high school. Because it's up to me. I just I have three uh, grandsons right now, and my kids know that I wouldn't want them playing football until they're at least that old, because then they're mature enough, their necks, are, their bodies are strong enough to uh, at least hold up a helmet, and then be able to take some of the blows that you're going to take on the, on those fields. So going back to your your college days and in NFL days, did did you grow up thinking that I'm going to be an NFL player, or that was your dreams and passions? I grew up knowing I didn't want to have a real job. I mean, uh, I love playing sports, and you know, that was a way to, you know, to have a great time and still get paid. Do what you want to do, do what you love doing, and, and get paid for it. That's that, that was a pretty good deal in my mind. So, I'd, rather than you know doing an eight to five job, even though this the job I was in, I mean, you showed up at eight and you got home about six. And, uh, you know, there was one day off. A week, you know, it's not as glamorous as everybody <laughs> makes it out. To, makes it out to be. There's a lot of work that goes into the one one game on the Sunday or Monday night or Thursday night or whatever, whatever night they play these days. Right. Yeah. And uh, I mean, nowadays it's even more. Uh, I don't know, twenty four seven news channels and all that kind of thing compared to back then with the internet. When you when you played, and I know this was close to the end of his his life. Did you? Get a chance to talk to George Hallis at all, or was he not around during that time? 
Uh, the last time I talked to George Hallis was uh, probably just before he passed in 1983. Uh, he would come out to practice every once in a while, and drive his little golf cart around. That's a, that's the last time that I had spoken with him. Was he someone that some of the old timers in the organization, they would continue to tell stories about, or was it something that by then it really wasn't discussed a whole lot? Uh, no, I mean, Coach Coach Ditka played for George Hallis in Chicago. So they, they went back a long way. Uh, and Hallis, Hallis founded the league. He, everybody everybody looked up to George Hallis. He was a, he was a visionary, and uh, he started the NFL. So you got to give him a lot of credit for that. Right, yeah. He's someone that we talk about quite frequently on my show, considering it, it's about the history and the, you know, going way back in time to the game. And you mentioned Coach Ditka uh, with the 1985 Bears and Buddy Ryan coming back. What was it like playing against his defense and uh, practice and making you a better quarterback kind of thing? Well, you know, our practices weren't any fun because we we didn't have any 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 particular sessions that were that were off. You couldn't take you couldn't take any time off, no matter what what uh, drill you were in or what. And whether it was an offensive period or a defensive period, there was never any buddy buddy stuff. You always had to be, you know, your chin strap locked down. And we were always in pads as well. And so everything was live at all our practices, which was which is nuts. And then uh, you know, going against those guys, it was you know, it made us better offensively. And I think we made them better. Because you know, our, our offensive line was pretty good. Once, uh, you know, starting from uh, 84 on, it was pretty good. So it was tough. I mean, it was three hours of, you know, fighting every play and uh, guys complaining. And, you know, the defensive line would yell, hey, buddy, they're cutting us. And buddy would say, well, do they cut you in the games? They'd say, yeah. He goes, well, deal with it. That, that was their philosophy. So you know, it was a war every, every period of every day. So Sundays were actually our days off. We felt pretty <laughs> confident whoever we played on Sunday was not going to be this tough. Right, yeah, totally different type of uh, situation compared to nowadays. Yeah, they don't even put on pads nowadays, so they can only practice so long and do this. I mean, it's just, I'm glad I'm done. <laughs> I mean, uh, other than the paychecks, they're making pretty good paychecks now. Right, right. Now, speaking of, um, you're glad you're done, going back to yourself, your rookie self, to say you go back in time, what what kind of advice would you have given yourself in 1982? You should have stuck with baseball <laughs> because 1982 was the, one of the first of two strikes that I had to go through. Uh, I think we played two games or three games, and we had a strike for I think it was six six weeks, eight weeks, something like that. And then, so we only ended up playing nine games my first year. And I said, you know, this is the NFL. I mean, this is – our facility was – our college facility was better than the one we had in, in the NFL. Uh, practice facility, everything. It was just – it was ridiculous. And now all of a sudden we're, we're trying to practice as a team by ourselves because we couldn't, we couldn't work out at the facility. So we, we'd, be at a, we'd be at a high school field. And, uh, I mean, it was just like watching a movie. Guys would pull their cars up, leave the lights on, and we're trying to go out there and practice. I mean, it was just kind of crazy trying to practice against each other. We're all trying to, you know, we just said, hey, let's just go to the bar and drink. This, <laughs> this, this strike is going to last forever. So, But that was that was all kind of strange that first year in the NFL. Yeah, I would imagine so. And then you dealt with it again in, uh, what was it, 87 or 86? 87. Yeah, 1987. We had another strike. I think it lasted uh, five five weeks. I think the scabs played five weeks. And so those two strikes ended up uh, doing good for the guys that are playing now, that's for sure. And you, you mentioned that word scab, and that gets thrown around a lot. I mean, is that was that what the true sentiment was from the, the players of the league? Was it a pretty um, war-type feeling? Uh, well, some people really took it personally, you know, I'm, I didn't really care. I mean, I, I mean, it gave these guys a chance to continue playing the game that they love. 
you know, knowing they, they probably wouldn't be on the team when, when the strike was settled, but it gave those guys an opportunity to continue on with their career. You know, we, we, I was just out there just with the rest of the guys, just, Hey, we're, we're going to sit out. We're going to you know, hang tough as a team. No, nobody's going to cross the picket line. And, and I don't believe we had any players to do that, but, uh, yeah, it was tough. Tough watching those guys. I think they won four, four of the five, though. I think that helped us because we <laughs> kept us uh, with home field advantage in the playoffs, which, well, didn't help, but uh, it's, it's supposed to help you when you have home field. So, yeah, someone that played at Soldier Field in the home field advantage, what did you get that feeling of like a home field advantage or was it no different business as usual when you go on the road? I, I didn't. I didn't feel that we were. I mean, other than the cold, I mean, because it was usually pretty, pretty cold in December and January there. But, uh, you know, I didn't like playing in it. Like I said, I grew <laughs> up in California. I live here in Arizona now. I don't like cold weather. And to have to play in, you know, 20, 30 below zero, it's, it sucks. And we had AstroTurf at that time, too. And, that's, and that's, that was hard stuff to get thrown down on when, when it's that cold. But, uh, yeah, we didn't have, I didn't, I didn't feel we had a, that big of an advantage other than the weather because we got beat four, four years in a row at home or three years in a row at home in the playoffs after we won the Super Bowl. Hmm. Yeah, no, I, um, again, as Lions fan, I don't get a chance to do that or to and experience the whole loss of a Super Bowl, but we have indoor stadium. And so <laughs> it's a, anytime I go, I never have to deal with the cold. Yeah. I played in the old, what is it? The Silver Dome. Yeah, I played, played in that one. <laughs> I mean, I just just thinking about the Silver Dome and Barry Sanders for me is just like going back in time. And speaking of going back in time, the, the one question I always ask every guest is if I gave you the virtual keys to my DeLorean, you could go back in time to any moment in NFL history and you could be a fly in the wall. What would it be? Oh, boy. I have no idea. <laughs> I wasn't expecting that question, but. Uh, yeah, I'd have, to, I'd have to think about that one. There's so many things that have gone on since you know the league's 100 years old. So, well, how about this? Maybe not even NFL. Let's let's scratch that. What about you know? I don't know your your walk of life, but what would you if you had some time machine? What moment in human history would you go back to? Oh boy, probably when I was 12 years old. I got kicked off my own dad's baseball team because he had, I stole a pack of his cigarettes and he, he kind of caught me with that. So I would change that. I wouldn't, I wouldn't have smoked those cigarettes that I did when I was that young. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, I guess uh, I'll leave it at that. Don't smoke cigarettes when you're 12 years old and I'll just, I'll end up, I'll stop the Not two packs a day. anyway. Oh my goodness, <laughs> man. Yeah. Thankfully I never got into that. There you go. Moral of the story. Don't steal a pack of smokes from your coach when you're only 12 years old. Definitely don't smoke two packs a day when you're that young. And but seriously, though, I want to thank Jim McMahon for taking time out of his day to take us back and learn about a little bit of 80s football with his time in Chicago. Speaking of Chicago, this week's My Football Moment revolves around a Bears game. But this time, my Detroit Lions, they get the best of them. This moment comes from Michael Lucis. Take it away. It was September 30th, 2007. I attended the Detroit Lions hosting the Chicago Bears. Lions were 2-1. and one. Bears were 1-2. and two. I went with my brother and two uh, fun but obnoxious Chicago Bears fans uh, that we are friends with. We drove to the game from Kalamazoo to Detroit, about a two-hour drive. Uh, the game was very boring to start with. It went into the fourth quarter um, with the Bears up 13-3. to It looked very, very bad for the Lions, um, but things really started uh, to heat up for the Lions. And it was actually the highest scoring fourth quarter in NFL history with 48 points, 34 of those from the Lions, including a interception return, a kickoff return from an onside kick at the very end of the game a rushing touchdown and a passing touchdown i believe that's the only time in lions history that has ever happened 
One of my favorite parts of the game is that one of our obnoxious bear f- friends uh, threw a plate of nachos after Devin Hester's kickoff return. They were kicked off out of the game when the Bears were up 20-17 to 17 and they weren't able to see the end. I guess I'm a little disappointed they didn't get to see their Bears lose, but we got to make fun of them on the way home, and it's still one of my favorite ever NFL memories of a game that I attended in person. Whoa, ho, ho. how about that? 34 points dropped in the bucket in the fourth quarter. I remember that game. It was like, Dan is crazy. And speaking of Dan is crazy, here's a few clips of my conversation with Jim McMahon about my Detroit Lions. All right, my man. Well, good luck with your, your deal there, and uh, you know, go Lions. Maybe one of these days. I, I feel bad for that, that kid Stafford. Well, he's not a kid anymore. How long has he been, been there? And he's, yeah, it seems like he, he does his part every year. <laughs> How about that? Dude like Stafford. And I even get a go Lions from the QB that played for every team in the North but my Detroit Lions. So maybe I got my card back. But we're going to go back. We're going to talk about Chicago again. But speaking of Chicago and Soldier Field, a couple of weeks ago, I played a trailer for Pigskin Past, which happens to be one of the three shows that are currently on our newly formed Sports History Network. Now this week, I felt it fitting because... Talking about a Chicago legend, Jim McMahon, let's talk about an episode from When Football Was Football, which basically focuses more on the early years of pro football in the Chicago area. So, here's that first episode that I already released from When Football Was Football. Perhaps you've never heard of a football hero named Mats Tanelli. While he played only one full season for the Chicago Cardinals in 1940, we still consider him the greatest Cardinal of all. He wasn't the most famous football player or the most recognized, but he was certainly the most memorable. Born in Lamont, Illinois in 1916, Mario Mazzanelli was a sturdy fullback at DePaul Academy in Chicago. His recruitment to Notre Dame was sealed when an Italian-speaking priest paid a visit to Tanelli's parents on the north side of Chicago. As a steady 200-pound fullback for the Irish, Tanelli was most remembered for his inspirational run against Southern Kell in 1937 that helped secure a season-ending 13-6 victory for the Irish. With the score knotted 6-6 in the second half, Tanelli took a handoff from his own 17, burst through the left side of the line, and raced 70 yards before being hauled down from behind at the USC 13. After an offsides penalty against Southern Kell, Tanelli cut inside the left tackle and picked up the, the winning touchdown on an eight-yard dash. As the Daily Times in Davenport, Iowa wrote, it was a swell climax for a swell season for the Irish. Following his senior campaign, Tanelli was drafted by the New York Giants in 1939, but elected to play for the Providence Steamers and serve as the backfield coach at Providence College. The following year, Tanelli signed a three-year contract with his hometown Chicago Cardinals and enjoyed extensive playing time in 1940 as both a rusher and a receiver. However, with the war clouds of World War II looming, he decided to enlist in March of 1941, and that was just five days after his marriage to his wife Mary. He was eventually was stationed at Fort Clark in the Philippines when Pearl Harbor was attacked on December 7, 1941. Shortly thereafter, the Japanese invaded the Philippines and Tanelli participated in the Battle of Bataan beginning on January 7, 1942. Eventually, he was captured along with the 200th Coast Artillery on April 9, 1942. The U.S. and Allied prisoners were then forced on the horrific Bataan Death March. In later years, Tanelli recalled, they marched us 60 or 70 miles in seven days. That may not seem like a lot, but we did it without food or water under a very hot tropical sun. In order to survive, the prisoners would set their shirts out at night and then squeeze moisture out of the material in the morning. Stragglers were shot, soldiers were beaten, and the injured were executed. Meanwhile, Tanelli clutched onto the one piece of personal property that he had retained during his imprisonment, his Notre Dame class ring until one day he was forced under threat of death to hand it over to one of his captors. Not too long after that, Tanelli was in the little lean-to, his shelter, 
in this prison camp and a smartly dressed Japanese officer speaking perfect English came up to him and said, are you Mats Tanelli? Tanelli, fearing for his life, said, yes, yes, I am. And the officer said, did one of my men take something from you? And Tanelli said, yes, again, not knowing what to respond to because he was not allowed to have any personal property in the prison camp. But the officer pulled out his Notre Dame class ring, asked him if that was his, which Tanelli said it was. And then the officer just said, be safe, keep this hidden, hide it at night, because you know the consequences if you're found with any personal property. And as he was leaving, the officer turned to Tanelli and said, by the way, I was educated at the University of Southern California. I remember that long run that you took in 1937 to beat us. I was at that game. Be safe. And that was the last Tanelli ever saw of him. Tanelli remained in prison for the entire war until the summer of 1945. And by then, the bruising fullback's weight had dropped from 200-210 pounds to, some say, 92 pounds. It was truly a miracle that this American hero survived those interminable hardships. Of course, during his long imprisonment, Tanelli had no way of communicating with his loved ones. On August 30th, 1945, the South Bend Tribune speculated that Tanelli was captured on Corregidor and endured the infamous death march of Bataan. He may have been one of the many victims of the Japanese inhumanity and will never be heard of again. Little did we know that three days earlier, on August 27, 1945, American troops liberated a Japanese prison camp and discovered what was described as a living skeleton by the name of Mats Tanelli. He had survived and shared how he lived on carrot tops and rice for over three years. Oddly enough, the prisoner was assigned the same number 58 that he wore at Notre Dame. Upon his return to Chicago in the late summer of 1945, Tanelli was hospitalized as he recovered from his ordeal and soon received a most welcome visitor, Cardinal's owner Charles Bidwell. As Tanelli noted, when he came up, he said, Mats, before you left the Cardinals, you still had a three-year contract with the team. We expect you to honor that contract. Tanelli, of course, was in no shape to play professional football, but the Cardinals arranged so that he could take advantage of a unique situation that many teams might have ignored. Tanelli told reporters that day, I got so many beatings in a war that I lost count. After what I went through football, Roughhouse is going to seem very tame. So somehow, Mott suited up for a brief appearance late in the 1945 season against the Green Bay Packers. Tanelli said, I didn't play much, but that appearance against the Packers allowed Tanelli credit for his wartime service. Back in those days, said Tanelli, you had to play both before and after the war in order to get credit for your pension for the seasons you missed during the war. I will always be grateful to the Bidwells. I owe them a lot. So as we celebrate Memorial Day, we remember a true hero, his miracle of survival, and a generous NFL owner who made life just a little bit easier for a deserving soldier. Let's not forget them and all service personnel on Memorial Day 2020. This podcast is part of the Sports History Network, your headquarters for the yesteryear of your favorite sport. You can learn more at sportshistorynetwork.com. So as you can tell, That was a uh, very emotional type of story from a hero of the country. Hero, not just in the likes of the minds of NFL fans, but someone who put everything on the line and had to endure some crazy situations that nobody should have to deal with. We ended up dropping that episode, the first episode that is of that podcast, on Memorial Day which every day is a perfect day to remember heroes like Mats Tanelli. But of course, Memorial Day is where we take time out on our calendar to gather to remember those that have fought for us. If you'd like to hear more from When Football Was Football and Pigskin Past, you can head over to sportshistorynetwork.com. Again, sportshistorynetwork.com. But for now, dudes, I'm through if you're through. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Football History Dude. 
To make sure you're the first to get the next episode, please subscribe with your podcast player of choice and head on over to thefootballhistorydude.com for the show notes and more information on the history of the NFL. And remember, dudes, where we're going, we don't need roads. We here at the Sports History Network proudly partner with 26 podcasts, all revolving around the history of sports. But did you know that many of our hosts were sports history authors way before they started their shows? It's true. We've got Joe Ziemba, host of When Football Was Football. Joe Zagurski, host of Pro Football in the 1970s. Mark Morthier, host of Yesterday Sports. Tommy Phillips, host of Lombardi Memories, and Scott Adamson, co-host of From the 55-Yard Line. All these authors have many books for you to choose from. To check them out, go to our website at sportshistorynetwork.com slash sportshistorybooks. Pick up your copy today! Soundtrack provided by Kevin McLeod of filmmusic.io.